Good afternoon. Welcome to the Chemical Sciences Roundtables webinar on open access and fair data. My name is Kay Wims, and I'm the program assistant with the board on chemical sciences and technology at the National Academies of Sciences. CSR provides a neutral forum to advance the understanding of key issues related to chemistry and chemical engineering, as well as promotes thoughtful discussion between government, industry, academia, and nonprofit. CSR standing committee members, Dr. Rob Malechka, Dr. Jake Yeston, and Dr. Karen Woolley will be our moderators for today. Dr. Malechka is a professor of chemistry at Michigan State University. Dr. Yeston is an editor at Science Magazine, and Dr. Woolley is a distinguished professor of chemistry at Texas A&M University. This is the third webinar of 2023 on emerging chemistry topics. We launched this webinar series in early 2020, and all the webinars are available on the CSR website. Please see the website link in the chat. Today's webinar will provide an overview on open access and its impact on different groups, discuss the impact of fair data principles, and highlight the opportunities and challenges of data management. The chemistry and chemical engineering community will be central in today's discussion. We will have a total of three presentations, and at the end of each, we'll address one or two clarifying questions. All other questions will be addressed in our discussion time after the third presentation concludes. Please note that the chat feature has been disabled for Zoom audience participants. Your questions can be submitted via the Q&A button on Zoom, which is located in the bottom control panel. Our moderators will ask questions on behalf of the audience during the discussion portion of this webinar. Finally, I would like to invite you to join us, join us for our upcoming workshop on October 9th through the 10th on the future implications of open access and fair data practices on chemistry and chemical engineering publications. The workshop will be a hybrid event at the Keck Building in Washington, DC. The workshop will expand in depth on the topics presented here today. You can register to attend the free event in person or online. Use the QR code, the link in the chat, or visit the CSR's upcoming webinars event page. With that, I would like to pass it over to Dr. Rob Malechka to introduce our first speaker. Rob. Thank you, Kay. So our first speaker is Dr. Tashni Ann Dubroy. Uh, Dr. Dubroy serves as the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Howard University in Washington, DC. She is simultaneously leading an overhaul that includes the improvement of Howard University's core network uh, as part of a partnership with IBM uh, and is installing a new university-wide enterprise resources planning system. In its first year, the Dubroy administration effectively reversed six consecutive years of enrollment declines and yielded a 15% increase in new and returning students in 2015. She was named in 2017 as CEO of the year in the Triangle region and to the 40 under 40 excellence in leadership list by the Triangle Business Journal. Dr. Dubroy began her career as a research scientist at BASF, the world's largest chemical company. She quickly ascended to the position of global technology analyst and after two years was appointed to serve as chemical procurement manager where she managed a strategic sourcing budget of $35 million. Dr. Dubroy earned her PhD in physical organic chemistry from North Carolina State University in 2007 and holds an MBA from Rutgers University. Prior to her executive appointment, the Shaw University alumna served as special assistant to the president, chair of Shaw University's Department of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, and as an associate professor of chemistry. And with that, I will hand over the Zoom to Dr. Dubois. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I look forward to being able to share a few uh, principles with you um, and a few best practices that Howard University is using 
as we transform into an R1 institution and as we respond to open access uh, and the fair data principles that are quite upon us right now. I'm gonna share my slides here. If you give me one moment. Sorry, this slideshow. So in order to give you a bit of context, I figured I would put some information about Howard University and what it is that we've been up to since our founding in 1867. Currently, we have a student enrollment of about 13,000 students. We're tracking as, a, as an R2 university, but we are slated to become R1. We have coordinated via our Office of Research to develop um, a, a, an interdisciplinary effort to ensure that the university meets all the parameters to become an R1 institution. Uh, it turns out we used to um, have an R1 designation, but it was revoked um, at a time during which the criteria changed and we fell outside of the R1 band. So we're looking forward to being able to demonstrate that we are an institution that has high research activity once more. Our 14 schools and colleges include the College of Medicine, Pharmacy, Dentistry, and Engineering, and we have an academical, uh, academic medical center and a hospital that is affiliated with the university as well. Uh, we share a consolidated balance sheet. And I'm telling you all of these stats just so that you can get an idea of the size of the institution. Uh, it turns out that our endowment is a, it's a, uh, hovering at about one billion now. Um, and that endowment is the largest among HBCUs, uh, the institutions that follow closely with it. I think they're now booking around 500 million. And that's only one of them. And I think the second closest would be at around 350 million. There, here we go. Let's see why this isn't advancing. There we go. So I am demonstrating what the fair guiding principles are. I think we are all aware of them by now, having data that is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We have about 100 HBCUs that are recognized by the federal government. I'm only using a few of those logos here, but they're largely concentrated in the South and on the Southeast of the nation. And we have an HBCU in the US Virgin Islands as well. As you can imagine, having 100 HBCUs, they vary in size, they vary in the amount of budget that they're able to um, allocate to research. There's some of our institutions that are not research oriented and are largely teaching institutions, um, but all of them struggle for funding and all of them need um, open access services, especially when they don't have the resources to be able to stand up um, any activities on their own or subscribe to major journals. As I mentioned, we are within the band of institutions, especially in the district, that are considered to have high or very high research activity. We rank among 131 of the universities across the US, with five other universities in the district being able to maintain the Carnegie classification. Our strategy, Howard Forward, calls for us to regain that um, R1 designation by 2024 and we're tracking uh, very well to be able to do so. I wanna talk a little bit about our HBCUs and the disparate funding that has been issued to them over the years and why it is that we have to be exceptionally creative um, as we think about partnerships and especially with the federal government or with our peers. It turns out that the monies that has been, have been allocated to supporting science and engineering um, at HBCUs, it's declined significantly over the years. You can look at this graph and it tells a story on its own. Uh, the funding has certainly um, been meager um, even back in 2001 and now um, it's becoming much more detrimental to the survival of our science and engineering programs. Um, so we have spoken as a collective with the federal government. We have spoken with um, grant and funding agencies to demonstrate uh, how it is that the, in the poor investment over the years has impacted our students. And so I think the feds are paying attention um, and we have a lot of work to do, but I look forward to being able to, you know, come back to demonstrate that the type of investment that um, is needed for HBCUs uh, has been allocated to them. 
I think, you know, I, I'm speaking about HBCUs because I am on an HBCU campus, but I think uh, this story could be retold if we spoke about HSIs and um, if we spoke about small institutions, especially those in the small private category um, that may not be as research intensive, but still um, would benefit from having research funding. In terms of the Department of Education and what has been done uh, in recent years, uh, the federal government allocated about 198 million of American Rescue Plan higher education funds to support community colleges, rural and MSIs. Now, as you can imagine, it's never enough. Uh, there aren't enough funds for us to be able to stretch across all of the institutions that fall under these categories, but any amount helps. Uh, Howard quickly realized though, that there had to be a, a value proposition that our researchers demonstrated um, that would allow us to be able to attract larger grants, um, especially those that meant something substantive to advance in research across the nation. And so as a collective, we were allocated about 2.7 billion in total COVID support over the last three years. Recall that there are about 100 HBCUs. So the math can tell for itself um, what it is that we've been able to see in terms of uh, the allocation of funding across our institutions understanding that they vary in size and that size um, of the institution, the funding that is uh, ushered to them would be commensurate with the size of the student population. Howard University, North Carolina a and University and Morgan State all posted record research expenditures in 2022. And we're getting closer to qualifying for that R1 status. Our enrollment has increased over time, but also the enrollment of HBCUs nationwide only increased by about 8,000 um, during the uh, 2022 year. A lot of people are under the misconception that we've had um, a really significant rise in the amount of students that are matriculating at HBCUs simply because we had a COVID event. That's not been the case. If you were to look at the um, HBCU population and look at individual schools, one would quickly notice that the, the HBCUs that are smaller in rural areas um, and don't have um, a significant value proposition for our students, you know, the why uh, for attending, they did not experience an increase in the, in the enrollment. And so we still have to think about how it is that we can be supportive of them how it is leading the charge in being able to do so. And there are a few other PWIs that are doing it well. We were um, awarded uh, 122 million in um, annual research funding, and that allowed us to create a significant opportunities for our students. And this was uh, between the years of 2017 and, and 2021. This is new funding coming into the university. Um, it really means a lot for the university, as you can imagine, because uh, our researchers, in some cases, we've been able to attract um, researchers that have left their institutions and uh, come to the university and brought their talent with them. And I think because of the kind of research output that we've been able to demonstrate over this short period of time, we were also able to attract a university affiliated research center. Um, via a partnership with the Department of Defense. It awards us about $90 million over a five-year period. But it leads me to speak about the infrastructure, uh, the same type of infrastructure that we're, infrastructural challenges that we're talking about as we think about open access, as we think about fair data principles. It's the same concepts that um, result in us having to bolster our infrastructure in order to be able to accept major grants of this kind. And um, we are still working to ensure that we can attract even more federal partnerships uh, simply because we have the research capacity to be able to do so. I think there are a few things that we've got to consider when we're thinking about how it is that um, we approach open access, the variety of campuses that we have, the variety of resources that we all have. And the, the real question is, can every university afford open access? Can every university afford to be in compliance with the fair data guidelines that are coming up, coming through the pipeline? And I think you, you would get a mixed bag of results if you were to ask various campus administrators that question. It turns out that the White House has stated that public access to all university funded research papers, they're expecting that um, to be public by 2025. 
And that's no easy feat. Uh, there's some scientists I can guarantee you on campuses who aren't aware of this um, mandate that's coming down from the federal government. And so we have a duty as uh, administrators to be able to ensure that we're conducting the type of, type of communication throughout our organizations um, so that they understand how it is that their um, participation or lack thereof will impact our universities and our ability to attract federal funding and other types of funding if we're not in compliance. I looked around for um, information on journal prices, how they've escalated, especially compared to the budgets that we've allocated to being able to um, bring in various journals to campuses and make them available. And you can tell um, from the, the graph that I've, that I've uh, shown here that the average health sciences journal price has changed significantly since 2013. Uh, escalating in costs by about 85% over time, while there has been a negative change and, start, and very sharp decline in uh, the collection of budget changes since uh, 2013 during that same period of time, meaning uh, the budget is just not um, on par with the rate of escalation for the journal costs. So I think that's a story that we can often tell at our universities of course, sure, one can argue that there has been uh, access to, to journals that um, are free, right? And there has been more access that's available to us. But I don't think we can uh, ignore the fact that the budget allocations for um, common journals that are to be shared across campus uh, hasn't been the same as it was in prior years. And even um, prior to this, we were still underfunded. And the librarians tell this story much better than I can. There are tools that are being used to save universities millions of dollars in journal subscription. One is called OnSub. SUNY has a story where they were facing an annual $9 million bill for its subscription of about 2,200 Elsevier uh, titles. And by using OnSub, they were able to tell which journals were had higher utilization rates. They parsed, they, they, they shaved down the um, spending to about 2 million a year and subscribe to about 248 journals compared to the um, larger massive journals that they were doing prior to this. And sure, you know, that's one way to do it, but I just wanted to make uh, it available to you in case it's something that our campuses have to do. And putting it in context, the total revenue for HBCUs in 2020, to, in the 2021, to, pardon me, the 2020 to 2021 fiscal year was 12.4 billion with, with 1.8 coming from student tuition and fees. As you can imagine with 100 HBCUs, uh, this does not bode well for the sector. It, we are severely under-resourced. And when we're talking about you know, how we compare to one other university, forgive me if anybody from UConn is in the um, audience, but their revenues were at 2.6 billion. And so uh, we've got a lot of work to do. If we are to be in compliance with some of the mandates that are coming down, uh, they, we have to find unique ways to partner with other universities uh, in order to help to meet some of the demands and the mandates that are coming through the pipeline. So how do we ensure that our institutions of all types have the foundations for OA and fair access? Well, Princeton is doing it well. Princeton has a partnership with other HBCUs um, where they were able to assist with us receiving support uh, for our research uh, activities. Binghamton University, as part of the SUNY system, they were able to um, do it well. They were able to assist us through a research alliance where they are pooling resources to assist HBCUs who don't have the resources when uh, standing alone. And it leads me into thinking about how do we comply? Yes, we've been able to have uh, strong partnerships with a few HBCUs, but that doesn't mean that the entire sector rises because there are a select few that have been able to uh, command these partnerships. So there's still room for us to be able to do more together. I think if we look at our pharmacy school, for example, uh, our pharmacy school has a very high demand for what type of information should be made public. And, and it's always under a, a, a very unreasonable deadline. And so there's a lot to work through there. 
uh, we expect that our campus is going to have to be ready for the types of mandates that will be coming through the pipeline. And I, and I think it's going to increase um, in terms of the speed at which these uh, mandates are coming at us. So we've got a plan. And we certainly have a mitigation plan as well. We are uh, trying to partner with PWIs across the nation and with other HBCUs uh, to see how it is that we can comply with open access, create a culture of open access. What we've done here at the university, we um, were awarded a grant and the title of it is All of Us because we're working on data analytics training and software training, not only to get our campus researchers to collaborate with each other, but also to reach across other universities uh, to see how it is that we can develop strategies for success, especially, especially as it relates to open access. There has to be interdisciplinary collaboration, and that doesn't start at the point of open access solely. It starts with our Office of the Provost, in our example, where we are ensuring that uh, the sciences, whether it's natural, physical, and the humanities are intertwined with each other. We have several projects that have been successful, developed under our innovation division, where um, we are combining degrees uh, so that students get exposed not only to the hard sciences, but in the humanities, and they can leave the university with credentials that support that. And I think those types of foundations where we get accustomed to the collaborations across the university then bode well for us as we have conversations about open access. We're certainly allocating resources where needed and we are continuing to share best practices. We've got to ensure that the mission for open access is institutionalized. So our librarian compliance division, the Office of the Provost, and that includes the Office of the Research, is. Um, developing an organizational change management plan uh, with the intentions of ensuring that everyone understands all of the principles and knows how it is that they can participate in the same. As I mentioned, training is paramount. Uh, it's important for us to train our professors on what open access means, uh, what it means for their research outputs, what it means for um, data integrity, what it means for uh, their success especially as it relates to the timing of when data is released. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned over the years when participating in roundtables, I've heard HBCUs uh, speak about the research efforts that they have on campus, sharing via open access, and then having a more well-resourced university amplify their research um, before they even get an opportunity to come to a conclusion. And so I think there are some fears that are uh, warranted, but then there are unwarranted fears as well. But we have to walk through every one of them and ensure that the university is going at a pace of change that people can uh, get on board with and understand. We talk about listening and learning from the organization as administrators because we want to ensure that we're getting feedback from our organization on how things are going. I won't read through everything, but it's important for us to find university champions, reward those who contribute to open access, and ensure that the university is always being an advocate uh, for policy changes where needed. And with that, I'll end it there. I did a speed talk because I had to get through so many slides, but if you have any questions, uh, Rob, I'll send it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dubois. Uh, so there, there are no uh, actual clarifying questions. We do have a great question that we will uh, panel discussion. Um, but uh, I think your talk was uh, demanded no clarifying questions, so that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now turn the Zoom over to uh, Jake, who uh, will be introducing our next speaker. Okay, thanks so much. Um, our second speaker today is Leah McEwen, who's the chemistry librarian at Cornell University, where she has supported information discovery and scholarly communication in the chemical sciences since 1999. She is an active contributor to national and international chemical information initiatives, organizing dozens of thematic programs on research documentation and dissemination. She has served as both secretary and program chair for the American Chemical Society Division of Chemical Information, 
and on the ACS Joint Board Council Committees on Publishing, Ethics, and Chemical Safety. She is a founding chair of the Research Data Alliance Chemistry Research Data Interest Group and a board member of the International Chemical Identifier or INCHI Trust. She currently serves as chair of the IUPAC Committee on Publications and Cheminformatics Data Standards to facilitate design and implementation of digital standards. She is the lead on the chemistry case study for the CODATA RDA World Fair Initiative to advance fair data practices and is an international advisor for the NFDI4 Chem Research Data Infrastructure Consortium in Germany. She holds master's degrees in nutritional biochemistry from Cornell and library and information science from Emporia State University and was the first Paul Otlet Eugene Garfield Fellow at the Science History Institute. And I know I personally have benefited a great deal from Leah's advice over the years on fair data best practices, and I'm very much looking forward to her talk today. Thanks very much, Jake. Um, it's a, it's just a, it's, a, it's actually it's an honor to be here. This is a really amazing um, set of speakers, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Um, I'm trying to get the slideshare going. All right, is that going for everybody? Yes. Great. Okay. So um, thanks so much for, for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in the Chemical Sciences Roundtable. Um, this is, this is a, a very, um, it's a very impactful and timely topic. Uh, I think um, Tashi did an amazing job of, of clarifying how and why that's so important um, for our community um, and to enable all of us who participate in this community um, to realize um, as much as we can. I'm just going to touch a bit on on a little bit more on FAIR and chemistry in particular, look at some examples um, coming at this from a, a kind of a pragmatic level. As chemistry librarian at Cornell University, it's, it's a, a great part of my work is to work directly one-on-one uh, -on -one with individual researchers and research groups on challenges that they're navigating with publishing and and um, working with their research data. So that's a lot of what my perspective is driven by. Um, I just wanted to put these up here. Um, I wasn't going to go into any detail on these, but just as a starting point, um, chemistry really is a data-driven science and has been through the history of, uh, of, of this research area. Um, and I think the opportunity here really is that um, we can really uh, realize not only many more uh, opportunities and much greater value from the data that, that we collect in chemistry, um, but also realize um, some, hopefully, some supporting mechanisms uh, and maybe even some cost management um, for our scholarly exchange um, across uh, our community and at, with, the, with the greater global community at large um, regards chemistry data and information. Um, but that's, that, that's a long story <laughs> and takes a lot of uh, players. I'm hoping my internet uh, hangs in there. We've had a little trouble here today, so uh, any apologies ahead. I think we've kind of been through the fair data principles already, uh, and we will continue to do these. I think it is worth saying here on, on this slide, um, really that the emphasis is on handling um, data automatically across the cloud um, as much as possible. And this is really, um, the thrust is to be as open as possible and to provide this opportunity for merging data across different use cases. And there's any number of amazing <clears throat> applications that are, are emerging in this space. Um, uh, we can think of any number of uh, use cases for chemistry data along with other types of data to address uh, challenges. I was just on a <clears throat> another panel yesterday about decarbonization and then you know and pulling in material science and and transportation data and and many other types. Um, I think also uh, it's really important to recognize that uh, fair operates at a at a very technical level. And the implications here, I think, in, in this panel uh, and for the workshop will be in part around uh, the infrastructure that's needed to support that. Um, that's, a, that's a real challenge for us, and that's where there's going to be some cost uh, and coordination coming in. Another point I think it's worth emphasizing here um, is that a lot of value can be realized from FAIR in, in a gradual stepwise manner, and um, in including just starting with your local re research data management um, process. Uh, this figure here on the lower right is um, from the, um, a group working in the industrial sector, um, but they're realizing that even if they're not fully prepared to open up all of their processes in their, in their data, um, that they can realize a lot of benefit um, from FAIR, uh, including some 
some uh, technical progress um, implementing it locally um, and inside their company and to actually maximize the value out of their data uh, for their company. So there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, I'm just delighted about how much exploration there's been in this area, but we have a long way to go. Um, so getting down into the weeds about how data flows in chemistry, um, you know, this represents potentially a typical workflow that many of us might have engaged in as, um, managing our data over time, um, collecting some observations, working with instruments, um, definitely utilizing some software uh, to analyze our results and in generating more process data, the, the XY numeric kind. Um, might pull this all together in a supplementing, supplemental information document or write into the manuscript, uh, cutting and pasting uh, figures and, and, and values that have been generated along, along the way and um, compiling all this and um, uh, putting it to the publisher. Um, at that point, there's been some work um, to start engaging with repositories over the last uh, uh, few years as there's been some mandates I'm um, suggesting that more data sharing is is beneficial, um, but this has really been a very, uh, very low level and, and broad um, uh, implementation for the most part across many communities. Um, some journals, a rare few, might even um, uh, incorporate a, have a data analyst or have active peer review on the data. This varies quite a lot by disciplines and in chemistry, it's probably not very prominent, but there are a few examples. So the question is really becomes, you know, can we iterate on this if we want to scale this? And that was part of what I was asked you to, th to think about today was, uh, the, you know, what's what about the 80 percent? So we have a, a wonderful uh, effort uh, amongst many research groups to pioneer ways forward on this, um, but a, a lot of challenge for the, the greater community. Um, so in 2019, uh, NSF uh, funded a workshop uh, that I organized with a colleague. Um, uh, to think about this problem of how how we can iterate on our current um, processes and you know to facilitate more data collection uh, as we go throughout the research cycle, and and to package this up for repositories and getting it out into the community in, in a way that's um, more fair, more usable, um, more accessible. Uh, and in fact, in the intervening years, there's been an increasing number of of uh, communities working on this, um, workflows are developing. Um, they're in, utilizing any number of um, tools such as electronic notebooks to facilitate that. Um, more domain repositories are being formed um, in especially out of uh, granted funded projects um, supporting this kind of work uh, as well as analysis platforms online. So it's really great to see these things emerge. A lot more data ser support services on campus. Um, campuses are looking at data storage challenges. Um, but it's all happening at a very grassroots level. It's all very dispersed. Uh, there isn't a lot of uh, long-term uh, large-scale infrastructure in investment on this, and it's all still very siloed and, and specialized. So this is the challenge ahead of us. Uh, I, think, I think one thing I'll reflect on this slide before I move on is that this is really a heavy burden on researchers and institutions still carrying this part of the process to get the data together, to manage that data in such a way that it can be made available. And then once it's out there, uh, you know, what's the ongoing need for curation um, and, and to uh, continue to support access to that data ongoing. Um, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of burden on the institutions that support these resources. And what's not even reflected here, again, are uh, a lot of people like myself, librarians running around trying to help people put this all together. So there's a lot of burden in this, in this current mode. So I'm just going to move quickly here through some of these, thinking a little bit more about what FAIR and it means and how we can implement that um, more directly. Uh, it's really providing um, uh, the discovery and use process in a way that machines can consume it, <clears throat> excuse me, um, so that we can semi-automate uh, as many processes in the research process as possible and focus on the creative aspects. And for this to work, um, it really takes two major uh, considerations. And one is to expose as much of the information um, as much as possible and to utilize the basic functions for data exchange online um, that are already emerging, you know, so exchange protocols uh, in the cloud. And that is what's going to engage the data um, to be fair and accessible and reusable. Um, so when we stop and think about find and access, the first two um, areas of fair, 
um, what are the common search metadata that we use as scientists to look for information, um, authors and keywords, chemical structure information, maybe properties. We're looking for bioactivities, for example. Um, and in, in the mechanism of the cloud environment, um, one very common way that this is happening is through identifiers. I think all of us are pretty much now familiar with the DOIs uh, for research publications or any type of derivative publication. Um, there's also ORCIDs. I think many of us are familiar with those. And then there's any number of identifiers emerging for other types of uh, discernible um, components. Um, and there's metadata that's associated with these identifiers. And it's the information contained in that metadata that really allows us to create links between all these parts and how they're related to your data. <clears throat> and you can see on the right, there's your linked, linked graph. You can create these graphs based on the metadata. And this is all exposed um, in an online environment uh, where uh, programs that are navigating the cloud um, can link up to this metadata um, directly without even a human intervention. Um, so for an example of how this is implemented in one framework, um, this is for Scholix, the Scholix framework. Um, uh, there's metadata specified and that um, uh, defines the relationship between uh, articles that might be in journals and data sets that might be re in repositories. And this metadata is exposed in the, in the identifiers associated with those two documents. And so anyone wanting to um, navigate that connection, go from the, the publication to the, to the data set, or anyone else wanting to navigate to the data set, uh, can, can utilize that, that published metadata, you might say. Um, so, and this is just kind of all happen uh, automatically um, through this framework. And there's a number of repositories and journals that are utilizing this um, now. And here's an example of a crystal data set sitting in CCDC and along with the article uh, that is associated with it in a different journal. Here's another example. Um, PubChem repository is uh, supported by an NCBI. Um, they have a template where you can um, upload information about chemical structures and other metadata about your data, and they'll incorporate that into their data system. They'll utilize that information to match and validate it against their uh, structure model um, in PubChem, and then um, co-list information about your data alongside all the other data that they've been receiving from different sources. Um, so here you can see here an example from MassBank <clears throat> where some research data was deposited and then it can be indexed uh, into PubChem. And then another example was done uh, by my colleague at the University of Alabama, uh, where structure information was provided for their dissertations and they were able to load this into PubChem. And through that process, they've enhanced the discovery of their dissertations. And they found that between 40 and 50% of the structures um, that are associated with those dissertations were actually not found in PubChem previously. These may very well be uh, novel compounds. Um, so we, uh, PubChem's worked out this nice template that they use for this process that facilitates that automated process, but it, it's, a, it's a separate workflow for each user. Imagine if we could put this um, into something like the Scholix framework where it, it could happen um, more regularly upfront and automatically rather than having uh, every single connection have to be um, done one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'm just going to move quickly through these. <laughs> Uh, interoperable and reusable, those are harder areas um, to, to tackle. Um, you're getting into semantic representation. There's a long way to go with this. Chemistry is very complex. Uh, we really need to do a lot more standardization, for example, around um, even basic things like units of measure, and there's some initiatives working on that. Um, you'd think that chemical representation would be solved by now, and, and the reality is that there's a lot of different uh, rich uh, range of chemicals and materials that we work with in our science and a, a lot of different ways of looking at them depending on what kind of work you're doing, um, et cetera. Uh, reusable, uh, I think there's, I think this is area it is a lot, is a little bit more understood, um, but this is where a lot of work needs to be done to actually, um, actually create usable resources um, that can be used. So for example, a lot more work on file formats and, and licensing. I think the licensing conversation has a long way to go in chemistry. It's pretty nascent, um, but understanding what the opportunities are with licensing data so that the terms of use are upfront um, and what is and what can't be done and realizing that you can have um, you know, data that's not shared, but metadata that might at least facilitate a research process uh, still can be available. 
Um, I think another thing that's really going to be important in chemistry is the validation. Um, so if you're providing file formats that are consistent, still being able to check and make sure that those are implemented consistently is going to be really important. And I do want to also call out here, um, based on Tashian's comments, too, how important it is to professionalize um, navigating this landscape um, with everyone who's involved with this. So a lot of researchers, of course, will be interacting with these mandates, but also people like myself and others on this call who work uh, at institutions, um, in publishing environments, at the repositories, handling data. Uh, there's a lot of skill development that needs to happen um, for us to be able to do this in a, in a more consistent, scalable manner. Just a real quick couple of examples here. Um, this is crystallography, a kind of a, a high level view on it. Basically, you know, we, we, a lot of us are familiar with this story. You need to put your data in a repository in a standard format, and this covers several different repositories in crystallography. There's also a tool that checks for that. Looking a little bit at the, at the behind scenes workflow in the crystal data structure database, for example, um, there's a several different routes by which data can come into the, the repository, including directly from the diffractometer, um, but there's also a relationship that's set up with publishers to review that data and to make sure that the data set is associated with the article. Um, again, this has really been highly successful in crystallography, but how do we scale that? How can we utilize more consistent mechanisms um, for other data types so that we don't have to do this one one by one, one relationship at a time. That's where a lot of the work needs to happen, but we also need to make more mechanisms available that can be adopted as we go. Um, this is, I uh, just wanted to mention this one. This is the NFDI for CHEM that Jake mentioned in the introduction. Um, there, this is an infrastructure project in Germany where um, the DFG is a primary funder there has put a lot of resources over a five to 10 year period uh, for different consortiums associated with different disciplines um, to build out the infrastructure needed to really support um, the research process, especially on the institutional side. Uh, so for NFDI for Chem, the, the heart of their program is an electronic lab notebook that's closely associated with a repository. It's called ChemMotion, the system. And then uh, linking that data out from there into other repositories and making it more broadly accessible um, via some of these other services that are listed up here. Um, one great thing about, there are a couple of great things about this project. One is it's a really great use case for all of us to be looking to and learning and understanding the, the both the opportunities and the challenges, um, both scientifically and technically, but also institutionally and infrastructure wise. And also the outcomes from this project are open source. So this does give us a lot of materials um, that we can work from uh, in any more systematic approach we start using um, to implementing infrastructure in other areas as well. Um, so just th these are sort of my closing points. We really need to address this data reporting workflow. We need to really get this a lot more systematized um, so that the data get out there. Uh, we need to have a process for research data that's just as familiar and in routine and in progress uh, is, as articles. And I think Tashian used the, um, uh, used the phrase institutionalize, and this is really important uh, at the research community level as well. Um, we need to address this challenge of where are the data um, there are not enough repositories in the chemical sciences, and those that are emerging are mostly associated with uh, short-term time-limited grants, um, and they are not really scalable, um, uh, and they're not necessarily fully interoperable. They really need, this is, a, this is where the infrastructure boost needs to happen, and this is going to be a real challenge. And I would love to see not only nationally us to coordinate how we uh, think about approaching this problem, um, particularly among the funding and agency community, but also internationally as well. Uh, and then really the last thing um, that's, that I want to emphasize here is that is that need for standards. Um, and this is the part of the work that I'm probably most in, actively involved in, um, is just providing all of these technical motifs in particular and working with the, those in the community who are stewarding these um, repositories, who are developing skill development uh, workshops, who are putting policies into place to incorporate these as much as possible and, and streamline the workflows for everyone. All right, and I'll stop there. Sorry, I went right at time. All right, thanks so much. Um, that was a terrific talk and it, it looks like uh, once again, it was very clear. And so we got some good questions to discuss in the panel section. Um, and now I will uh, leave it to Kay for the uh, explanation of the poll questions.
Hi, yeah, I just put some uh, questions in a poll. You guys feel free to fill them out. Um, we'll give you about a minute or so, or maybe 30 seconds. So go ahead and make your selection. And I'll pass it off to Karen if she wants to begin introducing her next speaker. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our third and final speaker in advance of the open discussion, Dr. Deborah Otis. Debbie is the project leader of the Polymer Analytics Project in the Material Science and Engineering Division at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. She joined NIST in 2013 as a National Research Council postdoctoral fellow and transitioned to staff two years later. Her research focuses on machine learning, polymer databases, and using both theory and simulation to understand polymer physics. She is also a founding member of two polymer data resources, the Polymer Property Predictor and Database, and the Community Resource for Innovation in Polymer Technology. She is a member of the American Physical Society and the American Chemical Society. She received her PhD at the University of California in Santa Barbara and her bachelor's degree at Cornell University. Both degrees are in chemical engineering. Debbie will be talking about fair data for polymers. So the floor is yours, Debbie, take it over. Thank you so much. All right, let me get my slide up. All right, uh, can you see that? Yes, thank you. Excellent, okay. So first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I'm mainly going to focus more on the FAIR data aspect, and um, but I also will touch on uh, open science and open access uh, here and there. And I'm going to discuss a lot from the perspective as someone in the weeds, doing the research and really trying to make this happen. Both of our previous speakers have already gone over exactly what FAIR stands for, but I felt absolutely obligated to put it up here um, because it's so important. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, to check out this paper and kind of go through the checklist. And we're gonna find out that, you know, it's not necessarily so easy. Um, we kind of heard about that before, but I'll continue to go into that in detail. So I thought I'd kind of start with a question. So why are we thinking about this now? Um, I mean, of course, uh, there are mandates coming down, but, but why are there mandates? Why now? Um, so the need for data is not new. Uh, we've always needed data. Um, I'm a chemical engineer in my training. Uh, the Perry's Chemical Engineer's Handbook book goes back to 1934. I have lots of useful data in it for building your next chemical plant. Um, even things that maybe we don't necessarily think of AI, but in some sense kind of are, have been around for a long time too. We have group contribution methods for calculating if a polymer is soluble in a given solvent, which take in, you know, you try to figure out, I have this chemical uh, group and this chemical group, what does that give me? Um, and in some sense it is early machine learning, which of course required data in order to make that happen. Um, so it's not just needing data and it's not AI but under a different name. Um, I think part of it has to do with the fact that everything is, has been moving more digital. We have the Materials Genome Initiative, right? That started in uh, 2011, but this had absolutely no explicit mention of machine learning and AI. And we kind of forget about that because it's we hear so much about it nowadays. Um, it really talked about experimental tools, computational tools, and the integration with digital data. And that's not to say that machine learning didn't have a role there. It just wasn't explicitly called out. So all of these ideas that have been ruminating around have all kind of been there uh, before. But I think part of the thing is, you know, AI is accelerating and AI needs data. Uh, a little over five years ago, I wrote uh, this opinion piece um, looking at polymer informatics, which is the idea of applying data science, including machine learning to polymers. 
And we could see the future. We could see what was possible. We saw what was being done more broadly in the world. Um, we saw that what was being done in other areas of materials and that it could really be a way for us to accelerate the discovery of new materials and new physics. And this is mostly borne out in um, papers published too. If we search for polymers papers in this broad space, there has been a significant increase in those uh, published. Additionally, uh, kind of going back to these open science concepts, there's been a growing push toward open access too. And we can see that the numbers of papers in that category are is steadily increasing. So part of it is all of these things coming together. And of course, we're dealing with digital data resources. Um, here is a list of some of the Polymer online data resources that are present. And there are new ones popping up here and there. Um, not all of these are fair, um, but some of them are moving in that direction because, it, I mean, it's challenging, like we've heard. So as a researcher, we kind of ask the question, well, why can't we just make our data fair, right? It is such a simple question. Um, but of course, there are lots of challenges to overcome. And I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that specifically we're facing in the polymers community, technical challenges in particular. One of the issues that we have is that we have often have small disparate data sets. A lot of our data resources are put together, they're curated, by looking in the literature and putting things together. And um, the problem is not necessarily that we have the small disparate data set, but if they're small and disparate and they can't talk to each other, if they're not interoperable, or we can't determine that they exist and they're not findable, then that is a problem. For example, on the previous slide, I listed these polymer resources, and I compiled that not from a single journal article, but from looking at three different journal articles that had overlapping um, information, but some still missed uh, some of the resources. Another problem boils right back down to the chemistry. Polymers are stochastic molecules. Everything is a distribution that we're dealing with. We have molecular mass distributions. We have composition distributions. We have branching distributions potentially. And that makes it very difficult to just represent what we even have. And sometimes we don't necessarily even know. And that's what we have to do characterization for to try to figure out what do we have there? But we can't look in and say, oh, I have one of these and one of these. Another issue is that we have highly non-standard data. Uh, we often present our data in different formats and um, use different descriptors for the exact same thing. Um, kind of going back to describing molecules, Skills, polymers in particular, you could use the IUPAC notation, or you could use a source notation, or you could use a trade name. And these are all potentially the same type of polymer, and yet we call them something different. Furthermore, we have issues with process-dependent data. As a kind of uh, interesting example of this, we can think of the glass transition temperature for polymers. So when they kind of um, go from being more melt-like to being arrested in a given state. And so when that happens, depends on how fast you cool down your sample. And so you can end up getting huge variations based on what cooling rate you choose. And if you don't preserve that metadata, then it's difficult to reproduce. And this is why if you look in the literature for the Many models, machine learning models for the glass transition temperature, even going back to the 90s with neural networks, you'll see that they have air bars of 30 degrees Kelvin. And it's because that metadata was ignored, which makes it impossible to do design. So now I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we've actively been working on to try to address these technical challenges. And like I said in my title, this is working towards fair data. Um, I wouldn't say we're fully there yet, but we're definitely trying. And so to deal with the small disparate data, we've are 
uh, created a user focused data resource. Instead of trying to get a bunch of information from the literature, trying to go back to the source, to the users. Specifically, we developed the Community Resource for Innovation in Polymer Technology, which is located at this website here. And our basic goal is to try to enable science for the researchers by allowing them to kind of take care of the data management side of things. And this effort is led by Brad Olson at MIT and also has um, contributors from NISP, myself, University of Chicago, Citrine Informatics, and Dow. To deal with the stochastic molecular representations, uh, sorry, stochastic molecular structures, we're looking at new representations. Um, so my uh, collaborator, Brad Olson, and his group helped develop Big Smiles, which is an extension of smiles for polymers, taking into account the fact that we have these stochastic structures. So you have all of that chemistry is encoded, and you can encode your bonding, whether or not things are head to tail, tail to head, or either or, and you can have all kinds of different um, uh, ways of putting together your monomers to create complicated polymers and, and are able to describe that. Now, one thing that I should note here is what Big Smiles does is it defines a possible ensemble that a polymer sample can belong to. But then if you have a specific sample, then you have a realization of part of that ensemble. So for example, if you have a homopolymer, which is pretty simple, right? You don't have every chain link. You have a particular molecular mass distribution to go along with that. So the big smiles would represent all chain links, and then you have additional metadata that would allow you to describe that information. And you can check out um, the paper here. And then to handle the highly non-standard data and the process dependent data, we've built up a data model. And so the way that we tried to do this is we wanted to make it very flexible. Our users are doing research. And so that means that things change. And so um, we put this together thinking of it kind of like a flow chart or a graph where you have nodes that correspond to different things. So you have materials. So for example, you have various materials that come into some process such as a polymerization. Once you have that material, then you can do characterization on it and figure out additional properties. Or you could combine it with something else to do another process to give you a new material. And you can then do characterization on that and even include um, how you did the analysis of the raw data, because often we have to do some sort of analysis in order to get some sort of derived quantity. You can find out more about that in um, our paper in ACS Central Science this year. And so if we zoom into one of those nodes, this particular one is for polylactic acid, and there also is some lactic acid in the system too. So it has a unique identifier um, through this URL, um, which is cut off, but there's part here that would have the unique identifier, additional information like created by. A very important thing that I've learned about is the importance of having a note section, because no matter how hard you try to figure out everything that you might need, you will inevitably forget something. So if you have a note section, it gives you some way to at least capture that extra information. Then we have a section on identifiers where we can include things like the big smiles and our properties, which we can link to our data and include our methods. And then also link to our processes and um, provide additional keywords to help search. But it's not just our technical um, challenges that create a problem. We also have non-technical challenges, right? Um, as a researcher, we have the issue of, well, what do I do? How do I make data fair? Where, where do I put it? Um, doing all those things uh, requires a lot of effort and it also requires time. And so how do we have the time in the day in order to, to clean up the data and make sure it's ready? And then of course there's issues around the community and this goes back to some of the things that Lee was saying with standards. Um, 
and agreeing, you know, how are we going to describe things or at least agree on a handful of them so that way we can talk in an interoperable fashion. And so the way that we've been going about this is by trying to listen to our users. Um, and we basically created profiles for the different types of users that we might that we have that have different needs. You have some people who don't really want to worry about the data and they just want to do their chemistry, right? And then you have other people who are in love with code and want to run machine learning models on everything that they can get their hands on, but aren't necessarily as um, in touch with the chemistry. And then you have people who are all the way in between. Another huge thing in machine learning recently, especially I've seen in the polymer space, is more on autonomous efforts. Um, the components to build robots uh, has gotten a lot cheaper. And so that kind of has also been pushing some of these things forward as well. And so instead of thinking about things from the mandate side of things, we've been thinking about what can we do to make it easier for people to do their science. And so kind of the ways that we've been doing that is we're starting with our data pre-publication. So allowing people to put their data in right away as they're generating it. And the benefit for doing this is then you don't have to go back and cross compare and waste a lot of time trying to get your data just um, so and relabeling everything when it's time for publication. It's already there, it's already in the right format, it's ready to go. The other thing that we're trying to do is through collaboration. This is a cloud-based service. And so then the idea is that different users can then, um, you can share your data pre-publication um, with just the people you want to. So people in your particular research group or collaborators at different institutions. And kind of going back to knowing what our users need, we're trying to have different modes of interaction. So some people are going to love Excel. It seems a little foolish to me, but nonetheless, um, we still have our Excel users. And so we need to be able to support them. And then we also have ways of interacting with the system through an API, um, specifically a Python SDK. And then we also have the website as well. And if you enter in the information via one mode, say through the API, you can then go to the website and actually see it's there. So different people can interact with it differently as needed. And this kind of goes back to some of the points around automation as well, because then you can write scripts to try to handle some of this for you, um, which reduces error. We also are trying to have advanced search capabilities um, so that way you can do substructure searches. Uh, this is something that's very much a work in progress. And um, so that way you could search for all of the block of polymers or block of polymers with specific chemistries or with particular um, molecular mass ranges or ones that have particular properties. So, so let's say that they um, form lamellae or something like that. And so then you can search for these sorts of things. And then that allows one to do better comparisons. And comparisons is really important because we want to use our data in order to be able to form benchmarks for other data. And it allows for the development of new theories and the um, moving science forward on a whole. And then we, of course, also include things like automatic validation. So that way we check to make sure that if people enter in a temperature, for example, that it's sensible. You don't have something negative Kelvin. You don't have something with units that aren't temperature. And so that tries to reduce the errors that we have in our system. So everything that I've talked about up to this point is kind of more focused on, do, uh, sorry, on data. But of course, I, I wanted to say something else about code as well, um, as someone who does quite a bit of programming. Um, we should be sharing our code additionally. And this is really important because it helps reproducibility and the adoption of ideas. Unlike when you build a new instrument, you can't just magically carbon copy it. But you can do this with code. 
um, which really allows a way to push forward science. But there are still a lot of challenges that remain. I'm not going to go into all the details, but you know, doing proper documentation, determining what is the purpose of your code. Are you trying to make sure that people can reproduce your work? Or are you trying to build something bigger, like a package that um, people can use for their own research? And I think checklists could help here. So I kind of wanted to end on thinking of things as, as individual science. How do you, how do you benefit? Um, so by making your data fair and trying to make your science more open, which includes making your uh, publications accessible, you allow other people to adopt your ideas more readily. This directly leads to an increase in citations. And I encourage you to check out this reference here um, that talks about these sorts of things. And kind of going back to the first talk, um, this also leads to the advancement in the democratization of science. I got into science because I wanted to push it forward, you know, push forward the boundaries. And, and so that means that we want to have not just some people be able to do it, but everybody to have access so that other people at any institution can then take the code and the data that I've derived and build off of it to create something new and interesting. So as an individual researcher, what can you do? I encourage you to think about open science from the start and use automation when possible to make your life easier and also to reduce errors. And consider using data resources that are specific to your particular field and the use of preprint repositories, such as um, archive or chem archive. And for extra credit, I wanted to mention that you could also get involved in the Materials Research Data Alliance, which you can find out more at martaalliance.org, um, which is really trying to push forward these fair data ideas, thinking about the different challenges that we have um, and creating working groups around that. And thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. That was that was excellent. Um, we're going to be moving into the discussion phase, but I'm not sure whether, Rob, you wanted to give the outcome from the poll. So uh, I'm trying to find the outcome. I, I do know that the first question, the most, uh, the biggest, uh, uh, the most common answer was the cost to researchers. Um, yeah, sorry, I have it in front of me. Um, I don't know if uh, Kay can show the results or should I just read them off? There yeah. you go. Thank you. So if everyone has digested those answers, should answers to the three questions. I, you know, Karen, I, I think when you look at those those answers and, and uh, you know, let's remind everybody that they that there's still time to ask questions in, in the Q&A. Um, but as, as you look at the, those questions, uh, a lot of it is concerned by the, by the cost, but also is the infrastructure available and that comes with a cost. And, and so just to start off this discussion, I'm wondering if, if you or, or, or Jake can comment on what you think are some of the, the, the challenges and, and how will we actually how will we actually afford uh, open access fair data going forward? Aaron, you want to go first? What I'd like to do is um, just point that toward our uh, speakers because the cost is a, is a big part of it. And uh, as the first speaker had mentioned, cost is, is differentially uh, distributed to, to different institutions, different persons. Um, as a scientist myself, I think the increased cost upon the researchers is, is problematic. Um, and institutions will need to supply um, some support. Uh, and then and then in terms of what Debbie was just discussing, the infrastructure, it's really complicated. And, and so I'd, I'd like to 
give the opportunity to our speakers to um, you know, address these, these poll results. Jake, any comments? Um, no, let's hear from the speakers and then I'll, I'll weigh in after that. Well, uh, uh, since I'm a moderator here, I'm going to actually add by a little bit of my own uh, on this. And, and that is, is okay. that, uh, you know, I do think open access, the, the, there is a potential other cost here and, and, and fear data for that matter. And, and that is the, the opportunity to share data and make that available to all of us that does provide an opportunity to democratize science. One of the things that I wonder about, though, is how do we make sure, and, and Tash Nian spoke about this, how do we make sure that we're still making the field open to as many people to contribute to those, those data and to contribute to those articles that will wind up being open? And that's one of the things that I think going forward we have to challenge. Uh, we, have a, we have a challenge in front of us. Um, and so with, with my, my two cents, let's open up, uh, yes, this discussion to our, our uh, speakers. Uh, so this is Tashni speaking. Can you hear me well, Rob? Yes. yes. Fantastic. So one of the things I think we're thinking about on our campus, for sure, is, you know, alloc we, we have to be intentional about allocating dollars to effect uh, mandates of this kind. And so I think the, the first thing that we have to do collectively is prioritize it. Um, because we know that the challenges are coming and depending on which disciplines uh, are involved, the price tag may be even higher. You know, as a chemist and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of our colleagues on here have a chemistry background or even if, in your, if you're in another field, I often think about, you know, all the data that comes across uh, or desks uh, and all of the data that we gather and how on earth is it that we're going to even have the people power to be able to input our findings in some of the systems um, that we have or some of the systems that we procure. So it's really not just about um, journals and, um, you know, I think it's really that we have to find these infrastructural dollars as well um, to, to create the systems that are needed, but we're gonna need the people power to be able to do that. So all of those things are part of the collective that we have to think about and we have to allocate as universities. Um, I think uh, our librarians are doing it well as they continue to try to find resources uh, outside of the university, they try to find grants that are available to give us that alley-oop. And so it, it's difficult, um, but it's something that has to be done. Deborah or Leah? Sorry, I would have jumped right in, but I was actually just trying to type something in the chat. I was going to share, and I will put that in in a minute. Uh, the OECD collaborated with CoData to do a, a study on sustainable business models for repositories um, a little while ago. That might be worth um, looking at again. Um, yeah, this is a this is a hard challenge, right? I think we do need to retune some of the infrastructure um, investment uh, in a number of places. I think the poll indicated research institutions and agencies, and that's probably where uh, you know there's the most potential to to re retune how we support what we already support. Um, so I think I, I would love to see an opportunity somehow to study this problem, this challenge, um, break it down. Uh, across different sectors, um, across different, you know, sizes of institutions and sizes of data problem, uh, so, you know, think about the, those lenses and those facets that we need to break out. Uh, I think it, we just need a little bit more systematic view on it. Uh, I, you know, I appreciate that institutions are thinking about investment. Uh, thank you, Tashi, for, for tackling that. And please share your plan, because I think that's another thing. You know, a lot of things do happen through the community. Um, so the more we can uh, also outreach on on all of this, how, you know, how people are approaching this, what's worked for them, um, you know, and I think as well as the infrastructure challenge, um, you know, and I don't have to get into this too much more yet right now because I want to give Deborah a turn, but, um, you know, enabling research scientists can also happen through their own networks as well. And so getting out where they are and, and bringing um, workshops to them, bringing things to them, you know, what can you do now? What works for you? What's already available? Um, 
you know, maybe a, a little bit investment in, in people who are able to do those kinds of things. Train the trainer workshops. I know the data carpentry workshops, for example, have really exploded. Um, more of those kinds of things might also help from the grassroots level up. Yeah, I, I think I agree with a lot of these things. Um, I mean, I know that, you know, as, as someone kind of in the weeds in this, like, you know, it is a challenge, right? Um, CREPT is currently funded by the NSF, but at some point in time, it will not be funded by the NSF and making sure that we can continue to make uh, these resources um, available. Um, and so that way they have longevity. Um, I mean, as scientists, I would say, that, you know, um, you know, especially at some institutions, right, you have to, to worry about, like, do you have the funding for, for publication, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, you can try to make things more accessible, like I said, by using uh, preprint servers, right, as a way of getting your, your research out, but that's actually only one step, right? Like, if we talk about the democratic science as a whole, you know, we have to also be thinking about, you know, how do people... Uh, you know, there's a gazillion papers published every day, you know, how do we keep on top of it? How do we make sure that that we actually um, see the great research that's being done everywhere too? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a really hard problem. Um, and I, I think, I, I mean, the fact that we're talking about this, uh, I think is a good sign. And the fact that, you know, um, there, there is this realization of these sorts of issues um, means we're going to have a chance to move in the right direction, but there it's there's no simple solution. So maybe just to pick up on the, this idea of the longevity of, of the data. Um, and the, the part of that is then the longevity of the utility of, of the data as, as things progress. Um, can any, any of us uh, speak about the, the need for metadata versus versus data. Um, is it essential that both be open? Or does that make both fair? Um, what are your thoughts on uh, archiving and making available and open in the long term metadata as well as, uh, as the, 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 the data? Um, so uh, I'm going to twist into a slightly different answer. So, um, so I, in an ideal world, I'll just start there. I think it would be good to have both the data and the metadata. But, but one question that this actually slides into is how much data and what data? Are we talking about the raw data? Are we talking about the process data? Are we providing how we got from the raw data to the derived data? Um, which metadata do we need? Which metadata don't we need? Which metadata do we not even know? Um, we can't even describe. And it's really, really hard. And there are no like hard and fast rules for what one should do. And I've even seen talks where people are like, well, we generate so much data, we're gonna have to throw some of it out. And then, you know, <laughs> like, um, and, and thinking about these things is, it's a, going to be a lot of judgment calls because it's research, right? Like, it, it, like you can't have a one size fits all solution. It's just not going to work. Um, I mean, I think, like I said, if possible, it'd be good to have both of, of them open, but then I think it gets into this bigger question of, of what is the most useful? Um, when I try to share my own data, I try to think about this, like who would be the consumers of my data? What would they find the most useful? How would they be able to reproduce my work? And then I try to think about it from that perspective and then, um, share the appropriate data because it does take time as well to put it all together. So that, as usual, there's probably no one size fits all answer to, to these kinds of questions, you know, and it may, it may very well depend on, um, you know, the, the collective value of the data over time uh, and as aggregated. Um, so if, if, you know, that's one way to think about it, right? Useful data has been aggregated and in, over time in certain areas and maintaining that those collections facilitates um, making sure that all the information in there carries forward as technology evolves. 
um, as documentation evolves. So that's one one way to potentially think about it is is by the resource that it's captured in. That's not the whole problem, but I just wanted to call that out. Um, yeah, I mean, it's what you know, it's one of those challenges, right? As a librarian, I'm like, document everything, save it all. You know, right? But obviously, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> challenges with you know the sort of that that blanket approach. Um, I did I did just want to plug in though that documentation is critical. That is what the metadata is. You cannot have the you know, especially if you're saving raw data, where that might make a lot of sense. Um, you know, if you see the methods in the field evolving, uh, if you if you know the technology is going to improve and the resolution of the raw data is likely to improve, that's maybe an area where you want to be, you know, you know, saving that data for a little while as as things shift. But you need to document that really well. It, you know, raw data sitting there is not useful for people in the future. They don't have a, any idea about the parameters around around that data and it's not perceivable. Documenting things in a text-based way is something that can be readable one way or another going forward. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say this is there are some things probably you should definitely not do and that's not hard code you know, data or metadata into things that are not parsable in the future. <laughs> you know, we've, we've done a lot of that in the past, um, you know, binary uh, database systems were developed and are no longer very easily readable except you know on on uh, systems mirroring you know technologies from decades ago don't want to get into that so it's not a good answer but i i want to i want to combine a few questions that we got um as early on especially from, from henry Rosepa about you know where he pointed out fair and open are not the same Right, you know, data can be fair, but but still not be strictly open or open and not strictly fair. And and then there there was another question about um, you know sunsetting a, a data set where you know people have worked hard for the duration of the project, but you know what's going to happen afterwards. And I, what, what I think both of those boil down to really is is how are you allocating resources, you know. Where are those resources coming from and how are you prioritizing what to put them toward? And that also gets back to our poll question, the third poll question, which was, you know, whose responsibility is maintaining this? And there was a pretty even split between, you know, the funders and the universities, right? And, um, you know, then I'll, I'll also loop in Leah's point in her talk that I thought was a very good one, which is data management is a professional skill. Right, it's not something, especially if you're if you're standing up a repository. It's not something you should be doing on the side. It's something that people who have specific knowledge in that area should should be, um, you know, charged with and 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 compensated for, recognized for, and and so I think the 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 basic question is again, you know, how do we prioritize these resources? I, should 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 the should the the universities and the funders be working in concert? Should should they be talking more to each other? Is is there, you know, um, Leah, you talked about an initiative in Germany. Is that something that could potentially be a broader international model? How how do we think about you know the the, the best way to um, to 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 make all of this financially sustainable? All great questions, Jake. I do think uh, you know there could be, you know, there could be potential to prioritize maybe a few things to move forward. One thing that keeps coming in my mind is um, facilitate the discovery of data that is is becoming more and more shared. Because as we're all discovering that and it gets used more, and people are realizing the value of it, and we start learning what the limitations are, even either in terms of it being open or fair or sustained or you know accessible or um, you know, the more we can learn about this, the more we have fuel to make the case that we need to invest more. So I do think that if we could get these different stakeholders at the table to negotiate how we do data citation, um, you know, in all of our discovery tools, it, that would really be, you know, and maximize the utility of, of DOIs and other identifiers. I mean, Crossref is great. Data sites, great. I, I will say that cross-ref util, uh, utilization by publishers is kind of all over the map and 
you know, y'all have had an, a few years to practice and get this right. Could we could we elevate the level of practice in there a little bit uh, and make the beta data uh, more clean, <laughs> um, you know, so to improve the usability of it? Um, I think there's a lot of progress that's ready to go now, but it does take a we that does take the the community, the STM commun publisher community, but others in the community as well saying, hey, this is a priority for us to get this right. So that's a part I, I wonder if you have thoughts on you know the uh, what's the university going to pay for what's the funder going to pay for are the university and the funder talking to each other as as uh constructively as they could be i think there's room for um advancement of the conversations between our university and funders uh i think there are some funders that are more mature in their thinking about um, how it is that uh, the, the impact that the uh, that open access has on a university's budget and on our infrastructure, and then there are others that have the expectation that we will cover everything. Uh, so you know, I think as we continue to have conversations about this, that it makes it a, a much more palatable conversation for the science community and um, for our funders. I think every time we've been able to experience sea changes in our fields, there's always some amount of, uh, you know, I guess, um, opaque, um, for lack of a better word, sometimes there, the, 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 the clarity isn't there in terms of what our next steps are, where we'll get the funding from. But then, you know, over time, I think we work to, to make things uh, much more clearer um, and who's, who is responsible for what aspect of it. I, I've seen where uh, some funders are, or, or some entities, even vendors actually, uh, that have partnered with us for us to become R1 institutions. They have an understanding of what it will take for us to get from one point to the next. Um, we had a partnership with IBM. Uh, they helped to strengthen our data analytics program the same thing with um, SAS down in North Carolina. And so, you know, these are all part of what I think entities can do, vendors who may not necessarily be um, traditional grantors of, of funds to the university for something of this kind. But when asked, they've stepped up uh, to the table to offer uh, whether in-kind contributions through their uh, talent or um, to offer us a service that we've had to pay for. Uh, every single year, our budget is refined and I don't think it gets larger and larger. We're always um, trying to do more with less money. And so, you know, we're just not there yet in terms of how it is that we allocate enough resources to feed the outcomes that we need. Uh, so we've, I think we've got a long way to go, but what matters is that we've started. Yeah. And, and Deborah, I wonder just um, briefly in, in the same vein, if you could comment on, on how you got Dow involved in your project and, and how much that industrial support has helped. Um, so, um, so Brad kind of put the, the whole thing together. And so like he had been talking with some people from, from Dow. And so the, they are also thinking about these digitization type efforts, right? Of course, when we deal with you know companies, there's all kinds of proprietary issues. So right now we're focused on academic, but of course, if you have an academic data source that is you know useful for companies as well, right? Um, and then um, I helped bring Citrine into the picture as well because I was aware of some of the efforts that they were, were doing um, on their, their data models um, that were similar to the sorts of things that we wanted to do. Um, and so that's kind of how that all all came together. Um. So uh, we are at the, the five o'clock uh, Eastern mark. And, and so there are so many more questions. Fortunately though, we have an opportunity to answer and even ask more questions in October. So the Chemical Sciences Roundtable will, as was said by Kay earlier, will be following up this webinar with a day and a half workshop where um, many of these questions proprietary uh, data, um, industrial academic collaborations. How, as Nikki Paul asked, how is it that we can repeat something from a journal article in 
1880 that we can't do one from uh, <laughs> from 2008. Uh, and so all these questions, will fair data and open access improve that situation? Uh, will it make it more challenging? I encourage you uh, October 9th and 10th to put everybody who's interested in this topic, uh, put that in your calendar. Um, the, the workshop is free of charge. Uh, you don't have to be in D.C., uh, but if you can, I look forward to having a chance to, to meet you. And so uh, with that, I'd like to thank um, all of our, our speakers, um, as well as my, my uh, co-hosts, if you will, uh, and especially Kay and Linda and those from the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine who really made this possible. Um, Okay, I don't know if there's anything else for you to say other than um, if, if not, uh, I'd be happy to uh, just conclude by saying uh, thanks everybody, especially those who attended. Thanks to everybody who participated in the Q&A. Uh, and I hope to see you in, in DC or online soon. Thanks everybody. Thanks team.